Hello, and welcome to our look at A.K. Warder's Introduction to Parley. This week, we begin with Lesson 1, on pages 10 through 15. And boy, does Warder pack a lot into these few pages. We start by looking at verb conjugation, and then move on to some basic noun declension. So hold on to your hats, and here we go. This is Parley Studies on the Learn Parley channel. Perhaps counterintuitively, Warder begins with an analysis of verbs. In fact, he launches straight in with the first verb conjugation class, without really describing what verb conjugation classes are. Now, the term conjugation here is used in a specialised way, as the name for a group of verbs that share a similar pattern of formation of their stems. Perhaps a better term, in my view, might be just verb class, because I think it's more derivational than it is inflectional. Anyway, let's first cover some basics. As we saw in last week's tutorial, all words, and especially verbs in Pali, have a basic root form, from which their various tenses are derived. Traditionally, a root form is signified by the mathematical root symbol, and to this root may be attached various affixes. To the front are mainly derivational affixes, called prefixes, which change the meaning of the verb and to the end of the verb are mainly appended inflectional affixes, marking grammatical categories, and Warder generally calls these endings. Now verbs in Pali alter to indicate both tense and mood, and it's important to realise here that we're talking about the present tense, as opposed to past or future, and the indicative mood, that is, how we express factual statements, or at least what are believed to be factual statements, as opposed to commands or injunctions, or if-then, may-might type statements, as these are different moods and take different systems of inflection. And when studying an inflection, it's common to present a paradigm table. For any given verb, we can list the forms it takes in the present indicative by both person and number. Now it's quite easy to see from this table that all these forms share a common element, and that is bava. Bava is the present indicative stem of the verb meaning to be, and is itself derived from a more basic verb root, bu. If we compare this to the English verb to be, arranged by both person and number, we can see that it too changes form. In fact, verbs are generally altered to agree with their subject in both person and number. But whereas in English it's only the singular forms that change, in Pali all the forms change. In fact these endings are common to just about all present indicative verbs, and so are worth committing to memory, especially the third person singular, as this is how verbs are listed in the dictionary. These endings are so common that they're called the primary personal endings. Hoti is another form of the verb to be, but is much more common bavati being reserved for formal or eloquent speech. The only thing that differs in the present indicative is the method used to create the stem from the verb root. In fact, there are several methods, and verb stems are traditionally classified by which method is employed. And Warder follows the ancient grammarians in calling these conjugation classes and giving each a number. So Warder begins this lesson pretty much by diving straight into the mechanics of the first conjugation class. Now you don't really need to know the mechanics of stem formation in Pali in order to be able to read it. So you can skip over this next section if you like without losing much. And there's a brief table of contents down in the description. So if you want to skip over, go there now. OK, still with me? Well. Pali's verbal system is directly connected with that of Sanskrit's. In fact, the verbal roots of Pali are the same as those of Sanskrit, a number around, I think, 2000. Now, there are seven or ten, depending on how you count them, main patterns into which Pali verbs can be grouped based on how their present stem is generated from the verb root. And Warder calls these patterns or methods conjugation classes. Again, I must stress here that the term conjugation is used in a specialised way 
for a group of verbs which share a similar pattern of derivation. And in lesson one, water deals with just the first conjugation, so named because it's the most common. Now water numbers these classes from one to seven, so this first class has four subdivisions. Okay, stems of the first conjugation are formed thus. First you take your chosen root and strengthen its vowel. And this process is sometimes called gunation in Sanskrit. In the first conjugation, this process of strengthening only affects long and short e and u. The vowel a remains unchanged, but long and short i is strengthened to a, and long and short u is strengthened to o. In addition to this, some roots of the first conjugation are appended with what's called a thematic a, and conversely, some don't, and these are termed athematic. Now, there are some rules to the strengthening process. I and U do not change if they're followed by a double consonant. And also, long I and long U do not change if they're followed by any consonant. What this means in practice is that long I and U are only strengthened if they are at the end of the root. And of course, there are a few exceptions that don't obey any of these rules. Finally, a second transformation occurs when a thematic a is added to a strengthened e or o. These then change to ea and ava. So if we take the root bu for example, the long u is strengthened to o, which in turn is transformed into ava, so we get bava. And this is the present stem. And just to complete this look at root vowel gradation, there is sometimes a further lengthening which affects the vowel a. So a root vowel can have three grades of strength. And just for comparison, this is very similar to sing, sang and sung in English. Well, this is essentially the basis for the subdivisions of the first verb class. The first division contains all the roots which don't strengthen, but take a thematic A. The second division consists in roots which do strengthen their root vowel and take a thematic A. Whilst the third division is for all roots, whether they strengthen or not, which are athematic. And there's also a small group of roots that form their present stems by duplication of the root. But Warder doesn't mention them here, and the rules are a little involved. Anyway, that's how we get the four subdivisions. But as I said, this level of morphological analysis is not crucial for understanding how verbs are used in Pali. What is important is knowing the difference between roots and stems and recognising the inflectional paradigms. So a present indicative verb is merely the combination of what's called the present stem and the primary personal endings. Well, now we know how they are formed, so the next question is, how is the present indicative verb used? Well, the first thing to realise is that tense in English isn't as simple as you might first think, because in English we tend to differentiate between time period, past, present and future, and aspect, that is, how complete the action is. And we do this with combinations of verbs. But the situation in Pali is somewhat simpler. So as I've already said, the indicative mood expresses what are believed to be facts. And so the present indicative tense expresses facts or events that are obviously happening right now. But it doesn't distinguish between the simple present and the progressive present, in contrast to English. And it also tends to overlap a little with what in English would be the past and also the future. So, for example, the verb pasati can mean either he sees, which is simple present, or he is seeing, which is the progressive present. The present is used for timeless statements, like eternal truths, and occasionally with the immediate future. Also, the present indicative tense is frequently used in narration when recounting past events as if they were actually happening in the present. 
and this often gets called the historic present. Quite often a passage will begin with an adverbial phrase indicating a time or frequency, with the following statements then expressed in the present, rather than in the past tense as one might expect. Well, next, Warder devotes, I think, three sentences to explain that personal pronouns aren't always expressed. So let's unwrap this a little bit more. Taking the example, the recluse sees a boy. Now, the recluse is in nominative case, which marks it as a subject of the verb. And the boy is in accusative. It's the object being seen. And the verb is made to agree in both person and number with its subject, here, the recluse. Notice that in Pali, most words are marked by inflections. Well now, if we change this sentence so that the subject is represented by a personal pronoun, pronouns are just short words that substitute for substantive nouns and usually refer back to something previously mentioned in the passage. So now we have, he sees a boy. But because Pali is highly inflectional, the subject pronoun is actually redundant, as this idea is already expressed by the inflection of the verb. The third person ending, the T of pasati, means he sees. Likewise, pasasi is you see, and pasami is I see. This means that it's actually the norm in Pali to drop subject pronouns when they are implied by the ending of the verb. And this leads to some intriguing situations when we consider copulas or linking verbs. For instance, so darako hoti, he is a boy, can equally be expressed without the subject pronoun as we've just seen. And if you remember from nominal clauses last week, it's also valid to drop the linking verb itself and leave that as being implied. So all these three sentences actually mean the same thing. Okay. So we've looked now at how verbs in the present indicative are formed from stems and marked for person and number by inflectional affixes. Next, Warder moves on to an analysis of nouns. And these two can be thought of as a combination of stem and inflectional affix, which is commonly called declension. So nouns are marked to indicate number, case and gender. And unlike verbs, it's the stem form of nouns which is listed in dictionaries. Be aware that every noun has a gender. Substantives generally have only one gender, either masculine, neuter or feminine. But things like adjectives take on the gender of the thing that they qualify. And it's common to group nouns by the letter in which their stem ends because these have common patterns of declension. So Warder now lists some masculine A-stem nouns, all of which decline like the stem loca. Case here is used to indicate the function that the word is playing in the sentence. We've already seen how the nominative is used to mark the subject of the verb, and the accusative its object. The vocative is a simple case that indicates the person being addressed, the addressee. And we can say very generally for the remaining cases, they're used where English would use a preposition. So the instrumental marks nouns where English would insert by or with. The door was opened by the man. And the genitive marks possession, like the man's house. And Warder moves through these cases, explaining them progressively. And in this lesson, Warder concentrates on the nominative case. As already highlighted, the main use of the nominative case is to indicate the subject of the verb. And the verb too will always change its inflection to agree with that subject in both person and number. And also, any word which qualifies the subject like an adjective or an appositional phrase, which means basically two words or phrases which describe the same object. Here, the Brahmin, who is also a minister, sees. And this rule also applies to linking verbs, whether they're explicit or implied, as the attribute will always agree 
in both case and number. So we can see that in Pali, as far as possible, words referring to the same thing agree in case, number and gender, with the attribute following the word that it qualifies. Warder also highlights the adverb yena, which means where. And I think this is the only indeclinable which displays this characteristic. It's said to govern the nominative, which means its object, here the village, will always take the nominative case. And the subject of the verb here is implied by the third person ending. So it's not, as you first might think, the village which is doing the approaching. Finally, we come to T clauses. The particle T signifies that a word or a phrase lying before it is in quotation marks, and the T marks the end of that quotation, which means you have to guess where it began. So T clauses are how Pali marks direct speech, and simple phrases will be placed in the nominative case. But note also, as well as speech, T clauses also tend to get used for a person's thoughts. So that brings us to the end of this chapter, lesson one. Feel free to do the exercises. I'm not going to go through them here. Warder gives the answers to exercises one through six at the back of his book. But note that Warder's translations for some words are not always mm, standard. So I suggest you refer to dictionary definitions. And I've put a link down in the description to Arjun Bramali's walkthrough of this chapter. And next week we'll go through lesson two. And in the meantime, feel free to check out my other tutorials.